The time has finally arrived as Central Arkansas preparation has begun. That typically means a depth chart, which also typically means a surprise or two. And for every sports information director out there, it's 2023, boo-boo baby bear. Get with the times or get left behind. You are locked on Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you very much for stopping by to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. You know you can find us on every single podcasting platform as well as visually on YouTube. Find me on Twitter at all day o State. Here it is. The day for preparation has officially begun, which means, yes, depth chart. There's not... A bunch of surprises, but there is some. And I think probably the most surprising move that we should be talking about is the fact that Nick Martin is likely to be playing over Justin Wright. That doesn't mean Justin Wright is having a bad spring. Not at all. Justin Wright is actually playing very, very well. The difference is very minuscule. It's the same thing with the Alan Bowman and Garrett Rangel scenario. Right, It's a 1A, 1B type of situation. And I know there's still a decent amount of people that are wanting to pretend that this is all coach speak and Garrett Rangel's not really pushing Alan Bowman. The time is coming for everybody to see, and I can't wait for it. Another thing I can't wait for is to see Nick Martin on the field. Live, because Justin Wright has been playing very well. There's two differences. There's two differences between Justin Wright and Nick Martin. Nick Martin's a little bit faster. Nick Martin has better hands. The tackling's pretty identical. Filling the gaps, pretty identical. Responsibilities is pretty identical. Identification of things is pretty identical. Understanding where to be and how to get there, pretty identical. But the team speed is absolutely ridiculous. We should not be this athletic. We should not be this talented with our lack of recruiting. Now, I know that stars do matter to some degree because if you look at it recently, Georgia, Alabama, even Clemson, I know they've been down a little bit, but those are the guys that you see year in and year out get the top recruits, even Texas to some degree, right? So the teams that you see year in, year out that get all this love, that get all this quote-unquote uh, favoritism when it comes to the recruiting rankings and evaluation stages, they don't always pan out. Right? Texas is a perfect example. Miami could also be a, another pretty good example. But when you see somebody that is neck and neck, that's a good thing. That's a good sign. Because we got to face it. Last year, Mason Cobb was an absolute beast. He was an animal. He was in the wrong gap a decent amount of time, which did mess up Xavier Benson, which did kind of cause some issues as far as communication, responsibility, so on and so forth. It happens. It doesn't typically happen in Stillwater, but it did. And this year is considerably different. If we had any to any point in time, if we had Mason Cobb hurt, which did happen a little bit, if we had Xavier Benson hurt, which did happen a little bit, then you got to see Nick Martin. Then you got to see Lamont Bishop. And you could see that Nick Martin had some talent. You could see that Lamont Bishop was more of a, uh, a red zone type of guy, right? Lateral side to side capabilities wasn't exactly the greatest in his repertoire. Jeff Robertson was going to start last year over Xavier Benson. But Xavier Benson got considerably better. He bought in to being a leader. He bought into the system. And he definitely bought into Brian Nardo. But Justin Wright is going to be massively productive. This is just a good indication of how good the linebacker room is. As we said in previous episodes, this was the most surprising out of the fall scrimmages was the depth of linebacker. That I didn't, didn't see that coming. So we're finally in a position, unlike last year, that if somebody does go down, not a problem. It is not an issue. At quarterback, at linebacker, at safety, at corner, the defensive side of the ball is very squared away. And 
we, we talked about yesterday. I know Pat Jones doesn't exactly, you know, glowingly talk about Oklahoma State all the time, but he did say this is the most athletic defense he's ever seen in Stillwater, Oklahoma. He ain't wrong. It's going to be on display. We're going to be an absolute nightmare for people. Guys, another depth chart surprise to me is A.J. Ridner, a defensive tackle. We know what we have in Justin Kirkland. If Justin Kirkland can learn to be a little bit more violent with his hands, he is the epitome of what you want out of a nose tackle. And we still have him for uh, at least a couple years, ladies and gentlemen. Colin Clay is an NFL-level dude. Aiden Kelly is a little bit opposite of Justin Kirkland. Justin Kirkland just manhandles people. When he does get his hands overly active, it's impossible to stop him. Aiden Kelly doesn't have the, the benefit of the size that Justin Kirkland has, but Aiden Kelly's hands are insane. They are absolutely phenomenal. He will punch through your chest and send you flying backwards on a regular basis. It's some of the technique stuff. It's some of the, uh, the ins and outs that he needs to still kind of work on. Justin Kirkland can make up for stuff just out of brute force and strength. So when Justin Kirkland engages his hands properly and he has good hand placement, he gets inside the offensive line, the offensive lineman doesn't stand a chance. Colin Clay's pretty similar. Aiden Kelly, his hands are so daggone violent that you got to be a pretty good offensive line to be able to reset, especially down there in the trenches. And then A.J. Ridner, an Oki, somebody that I don't think many people saw coming. But he's been a very, very, very pleasant surprise at the defensive tackle position alongside Xavier Ross. You expect Xavier Ross to be able to kind of move all over. And you expect the defensive ends to have a very good season. You know, Cody Waltersheed and Anthony Goodlow, that's a good battle. Nathan Latou, Israel Us Us uh, Usman Hunley. I know, words are hard for me. I apologize. It's a good battle. Deshaun Brown is a savage. Jaleel Johnson's getting some work in. Like, the defensive line is going to be better than people anticipated. I don't think it's as deep as safety or as deep as linebacker or even as deep as corner. But it's pretty daggone close. The defense is going to be the name of the game this season for Oklahoma State. Maybe not better than 2021, but it's going to be pretty daggone close. And if your defense is that good, it's going to give the offense capabilities. Guys, there's not very many people, and if there is other people out there that are hooting and hollering and banging the, the 10, 10 and 2, 11 and 1 style drum, please let me know. But being on an island is not a bad thing, just like Mark Rogers said to me. You know, I, I sound like a homer. Okay. I'm only a homer if, if we're wrong. All right? But... A.J. Ridner is a big surprise. We've been talking about Jack and Dean, the freshman offensive tackle out of Arizona. He's higher on the depth chart than most people would have uh, realized coming into the season. The, the same can be said about Jacoby Sanders. Uh, Jameson, uh, Mejia, I probably said that wrong, but I uh, from Broken Arrow. That kid's pretty daggone impressive as well. Offensive line, we go too deep all across the board, plus we have a sixth man that can literally rotate almost anywhere. If we can get Elijah Collins off of the daggone bike, we're going to be fine. This dude's cramping is excessive. Like his muscles, I don't know if it's the Rob Glass, Body by Glass program. I don't know if it's the Oklahoma Heat. I don't know if our pads are a little bit heavier in the state of Oklahoma than up in Michigan. I'm not sure what it is. But Elijah Collins physically is having some problems. When he's on the field, it's pretty incredible. But he's on the bike more than he's on the field, which does what? Gives Jaden Nixon more carries. Well, now Jaden Nixon's been kind of on the bike recently as well, which gives Ollie Gordon more carries. While we're trying to manage Ollie Gordon's load, which was very intelligent, it's because of some of these issues, which is giving Sashi Vlahe much more playing time. It's also given a couple of the walk-ons much more playing time. And some of the walk-ons are actually producing and performing. So it's not a massive let down that we're having Jaden and Elijah on the bikes. Now, Jaden, he's been a little dinged up, but he hasn't been missing as many practices as Elijah Collins. So running back depth is going to be good just by process of numbers, by process of the workload, right? And, and, it's, and it's fair to look at it and wonder, is this the year? Is this the year we go to Arlington? 
and get her did. I think we could go. I think we should go. But getting it done might be a little bit of a different proposition. But before we jump into Heartland College putting out an article that the Big 12 has been told that they better get in line, we do need to talk about bird dogs. You notice I got the hat on right now, the hat that I didn't think I'd ever wear, but I wear it actually all the time because it's ridiculously comfortable. Bird dogs is the best thing I have ever been able to put on. Point blank, period. It's not even close. And that's the thing, guys. Some of these these ads, they're very beneficial to everybody involved. But bird dogs, they back their products. They, they prove it. They boldly take on the competition as they should. They look better than the little lemons. They've got the built, built-in boxers. They're not silk, but they darn feel like it. It's just, it's ridiculously comfortable. You can work in them, walk in them, swim in them, fight in them, go to sleep in them, wake up, do it all again in them. Guys, I literally am probably never going to own or or buy, I'm not going to purchase, any other brand. And it doesn't matter. Like When I'm ready to go to the golf course or I'm ready to go out to the movies, doesn't matter. I'm 100% ready to go. All day, every day. I don't have to change. I don't have to do anything special. I don't have to do anything specific. They fit way better than anything else you're ever going to buy. They fit way better than anything else you can go physically possibly find. And I'm a shorts guy. I'm a short short hoodie, t-shirt. I don't wear jeans. I haven't worn jeans since I got out of the oil field, and I love it. But I would say that I'm um, an expert when it comes to purchasing uh, athletic shorts, golf shorts, and these are the best. These are the absolute best. So do yourself a favor. Go to birddogs.com slash lockedoncollege. Make sure you enter that promo code, all one word, lockedoncollege, to get this free white tech hat. Again, that is birddogs.com slash lockedoncollege. Use the promo code to get the free tech white hat. And when they say... You're not going to want to take your bird dogs off. They promise you it's legitimate. You will not take them off. If you sleep in them, I mean, I do. Maybe that makes me an oddball. I'm not sure. But it's because they're so daggone comfortable. I can't tell the difference. All right. So here we are. Jumping into the next segment. And clearly, we've got to bring up this this Heartland article. Because this uh, this is great stuff. Now. I have a prerequisite, or I need to preface this here. I have been told by a few different sources that this gentleman, so I'm not going to throw his name under the bus, he's been fired from other publications for putting out inherently false stories that have no validity, okay? So take that for what it's worth. Now, Heartland, I think, sometimes does put out some pretty awesome stuff. But here we go. We're just going to read it and break it down. Um, uh, while conference realignment has both benefited and hurt certain aspects of college football this season, one major change on everyone's mind is the impact of expansion in college football. According to a recent post from the a recent article from the New York Post, sources claim that any conference not named the SEC or the Big Ten attempting to get in the way of how the two leagues construct, construct the future playoff is risking Pac 12ing themselves out of the future tournaments. One source cautioned the post that the other conferences risk implosion along the lines of the Pac-12, which greatly overvalued itself in the network rights negotiations if they stand to obstinately in the way of what the Big Ten and the SEC want. The original rules of the expanded CFP playoff included 12-team field makeup of the six highest-ranked conference champions at six at-large bids, with Pac-12 conference facing either inevitable doom or a merger with the Mountain West. The expanded college football playoff rules have been put under the microscope with the loss of a quote-unquote worthy conference champion now coming out of the Pac-12. While the rules will undoubtedly be reviewed and adjusted according to the CFP selection process, it's about as close to unfair as it could possibly seem. While six at-large bids and six conference champions would have made for a great playoff, I would expect things to flip around in order to cater to the two leagues at the top. The college football playoff committee is set for an official meeting on August 30th, and while official changes to the expanded playoff may take a while to agree to terms on, as the Brett Yormark, as the Brett Yormark and the Big 12 continue to increase their notoriety in college athletics, the decision to cater to the top 
could get a bit trickier. So let's just let's just jump into this area of that being legitimate. All right. We're, we're going to go off of let's say that's legit and let's pretend that we have a pretty good idea that it's not. But if it is, if it is legit, bring it on. The, the Big Ten, the SEC, they are definitely not a big fan of Brett Yormark. They are definitely not a big fan of what he's been able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. You would think that the financial gap between us and the SEC and the Big Ten would make them sleep pretty at night. But clearly, it does not. It has not. Greg Sankey moved the SEC media days. The Big Ten, you know, you haven't heard a lot out of Petiti, but they like to posture. So even though this article may be complete hogwash, if you take into consideration that it is legitimate, I think it is ridiculous. Could the SEC and the Big Ten be trying to throw the weight, weight around? Yeah, it's very possible. Could they be legitimately trying to insinuate or at least push out there to some degree that if the Big 12 causes any more stink, they're going to be left out in the cold? That is a ridiculous statement. That is a ridiculous idea that that would even happen. And if it were to happen, I mean, I, I do think that college football would find a way to continue its success. But again, this is all about dollar dollar bills, y'all. It's the same reason the ACC is not going to get out of their sweetheart deal. ESPN has it too good. Why would they let them out of a deal when they get the games that they kind of want for pennies on the dollar? It is about financial security. So why? Why is this stuff coming out? It's because people are worried about the Big 12. I mean, all of this, oh, it's insignificant and blah, 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 blah. I mean, you saw what happened to the back Pac-12 mouth-breathing buffoons that kept saying that we were all the Big 12 and on crew was full of it. We're making stuff up. And we don't know what we're talking about. And they have sources inside the offices at every school, and they know what's going on. How'd that work out? Now, I do know that some of those dudes knew they were lying. They were bold-faced, lying to their fan base. And it is what it is. If that's your cup of taters and you think it's going to help you be more successful, you do you, boo-boo. But this idea that the Big 12 needs to step aside and get in line, it's ridiculous, and it ain't going to happen. If, if anybody thinks that Brett Yormark is going to back down at any point in time, no. Nah. No. No. Ain't going to happen. If, if, if it's a war that they want, it's a war that can be provided. Now, the only way that this goes the other direction is if the Big 12 starts falling flat on its face, right? Last year, getting TCU in the national title game after what they were able to do to Michigan, that's helpful for the Big 12. If the Big 12 does it again this year and it's anybody not named Oklahoma and Texas, that's good for the Big 12. And then for the foreseeable future, Two teams getting in the Big 12 or the, the college football playoff from the Big 12 is not only likely, but I'd, I'd say it's probably going to happen more often than not. The SEC will get two in. The Big 12 will get two in. The Big 10 will get two in. And everybody else is, is kind of fighting. And that's fine. Now, why would the ACC get two in? I don't know. Is anybody under some massive disillusionment that Wake Forest would go into any other conference and have – very much success? Probably not. I don't even think the Wake Forest could go into the Pac-12 and have the same success that they're having. But I actually kind of hope this is true to some degree. Like, I would like to see a fiery side out of Brett Yormark. I would like to see the, okay, bring it, Brett Yormark. I mean, he kind of did that with George Klyovkov. He didn't get in the tit-for-tat battle that Klyovkov was trying to get started. Brett didn't need to participate because he knew what was going on. He knew it was happening. And he knew that it, everything coming out of Pac-12 country was complete malarkey. Speaking of complete malarkey, and we touched on this a, a, a gauche yesterday, talking about you know people like Barry Trammell, Trammell and, and Jenny Carlson leaving the Daily Oklahoman, the Tulsa World subscriptions have gone down. So is XM, Sirius, the whole nine yards, you name it. Guys, are people running out every Sunday morning to buy newspapers anymore? No. Is the, is the viewership of all of these big conglomerates getting better? No. 
It's not. Because people are tired of being fed bull honky. And it doesn't matter if you're into politics or not. Like, there's a reason that Joe Rogan is insanely popular. There's a reason that there's a multitude of podcasts that are absolutely exploding all over. Number one, in like every metric you can find for how the radio waves get disseminated, podcasting is kind of the new thing. I didn't think that whenever I was approached with the potential opportunity of this job. I thought it was, uh, you know, not much to it. So the same way I thought is how a lot of these SID directors think. Not a lot. Most are coming around. I would say that probably 70% that I'm aware of colleges, they now understand that podcasting is where people go for their information. Because it's almost the only place to get the truth. Are there terrible podcasts out there? Absolutely. But there's a lot of good podcasts out there too. And if and if you see a good product, it's pretty easy to typically get behind. So if you're preventing players, coaches, staff, former players, whatever, from appearing on, let's say, a podcast, what are you doing? Like, I get the narrative control thing to some degree, like I'm tracking. But it's pretty easy to look at a quote-unquote podcast and see if there's any relevancy there. You can see if somebody is going to put their foot in their mouth or ask a player a question that's going to cause him to put his foot in the mouth. That's pretty easy to kind of determine. But you can also see when somebody knows how to ask the right questions, Nobody, somebody knows how to guide things the right way, and somebody also knows what not to say and what not to ask because they get it. If you've been in a collegiate locker room, you understand what goes on. You understand the words that are be said, that are said. You understand the information that is disseminated b- amongst everybody. But the days of keeping a tight lid on everything, they're done. It is what it is. So to all the universities out there that are still trying to fight what, uh, what it is, it ain't going to work. There is no scenario in which you can keep suppressing people and keep thinking that it's going to be a big benefit to you. People go to podcast for information more than any of your ESPN, Fox, Tulsa World, Daily Oklahoma, all that crap fest. And that's what it's unfortunately turned into. It's more about posturing. It's more about protecting than it is being realistic being an actual journalist, right? That's the thing is people want to pretend that if you don't have a a broadcast journalism degree, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know how to coordinate things. You don't know how to talk to people. We know it's false. They know it's false, really, because they're in media. They get it. They see it. They know what the temperature is. So not everybody is going to automatically go pick up the daily Oklahoman anymore. And if you're losing the best people from these jobs, or you're having to fire the best people from these jobs because of budget constraints, you're a product of your own demise. Like ESPN, they're not up there up or scooping everything they can find up because it's all about the dollar dollar bills. And the the kicker of it is It's NIL era. Like people want to talk about Oklahoma State in in particular as far as like the recruiting goes. And if a recruit is coming to Oklahoma State or is at Oklahoma State or wants to go to Oklahoma State, they're going to want more exposure, point blank, period. And they're not going to necessarily always want it to fit in some little perfect, pretty baby box. There's some policies that are good. Like Oklahoma State has a policy of not letting true freshmen talk to the media. I I think that's pretty solid. Like I get it. They haven't been around long enough to kind of, you know, tiptoe through things. But that also goes on the person conducting. If the person conducting an interview or something to that effect doesn't know how to guide things and ask inappropriate things, boom, cut the cord. Later, Tater. But this, this whole narrative that if you don't work for one of these national syndicated publications, then 
what you do is insignificant. The players don't think that. Coaches, most of them, don't think that. And I'm understanding this kind of as we go. It is very frustrating when, I don't know, you, you feel like you're you're fighting a brick wall. And that that essentially is what's happening. And I'm okay with it. I'll keep uh, I'll keep keep on keeping on because at the end of the day, the fans do matter. The players do matter. This is a student athlete driven product now. That's what it is. So if you're depriving your student athletes of opportunities, you can't keep questioning why the recruiting numbers in the 50s. Now, again, I think the talent doesn't exactly apply to the, the distinction of the number that's associated, especially now with the transfer market. People that are you know doing the recruiting type of stuff, they're going to have to spend more time on current players in college because of the transfer market. That just is what it is. Players are going to get lost in the wash. I think Taiwan Ray is a perfect example. Taiwan Ray is a all day, every day, three star, maybe even a four star dude. But it's just his film didn't get around enough. So we we benefited. We got him. But this is supposed to be about the student athletes. It's supposed to be about the fan base. These are the people that buy all the tickets. These are the people that buy all the hot dogs, the Schwab dogs, and the beers. And the season tickets, these are the people that go to Dupree's and Chris's University, University Spirit and buy the shirts, the hats, the jerseys. Yet these are the people that sometimes get pushed in the background like they don't matter. So if the fans don't matter and what the players want don't matter, then what does? Like, this is a question, right? Somebody out here has the answer. This will change. It's inevitable. You can't continue to fight what is best for everybody. Eventually, you can't keep kicking the can down the road. So wake up. Wake up and stop pretending that if you don't work for ESPN or you don't work for Fox, that, sorry, you don't don't know anything. I mean, you can keep pretending. That's fine. It's a good way to eventually end up um, out of a job. I get it, but I also understand what it causes. So, what do you, what do you, what do you think these, you know, big time journalists? What do you think they're going to do? I bet you could guess podcasting, and you'd probably be right. Because why? Because this is way more fun. This is way more realistic. And this is way more accessible than the bull crap that you have to pay for in a stupid paper that prints the same crap all the time. It is what it is. And, uh, yeah. Bring it on, buttercup. All right, y'all. I think that's uh, that's all we're going to have for this one. Me and Seth's schedules keep conflicting. Um, he's more of an evening guy, but we're trying to, we're trying to squeeze our schedules where we can, we can both combine and and have the right time because when we have Seth on, I kind of want to go live for it. So this is going to be a decent segue. Give it to times or get left behind. Doesn't matter to me, but it should, should matter to you. All right, y'all. You know I love you. As always, God bless. Go Pokes. And thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen. Here on Locked On, Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere, but you choose to be here. I appreciate you. All righty. Later, taters.